The text this morning is from 2 Timothy, the first chapter, starting at verse 7. These are the words of God. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for this word. We thank you for your spirit present here with us now. We are very grateful for all these things, and I pray that we would open our hearts to you, enlarge our hearts, we pray. I ask that you would do this because we ask it in the name of Jesus, and amen. We are marking uh, Pentecost. This is our commemoration of the great gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on the first Pentecost, as recorded in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. One of the common mistakes that Christians make as they think about the Holy Spirit, is uh, who was poured out on the church on, on Pentecost, is the mistake of depersonalizing him. We mistake his role for, uh, we, we confuse what he is with who he is. The Holy Spirit directs us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not gather attention for himself. The Holy Spirit is not interested in us approaching him. The Holy Spirit wants us to come to Christ, and Christ is the one who leads us to the Father. Our salvation is a Trinitarian salvation, and it begins with the Holy Spirit impelling us to Christ, and Christ is the one who brings us to the Father. This is a divine humility. It is not a lack of personality. The Holy Spirit is fully God. He is not an impersonal force like gravity or electricity. The Holy Spirit is an eternal person, and he's so personal that he is the one who shapes a collection of individuals into a personal bride. The Holy Spirit is the one who he, he is has, he is so much a person that his gift to us makes us a personal bride for the Son of Man. This is why we can both extend, we both being our bridegroom and the bride together, can both extend the great invitation together. This is the testimony of Scripture as it says in Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Who says that? The Spirit says that, and the Bride says that. The Spirit and the Bride together invite uh, parched unbelievers, and together invite a desert world to come to the water of life. This is why we are able to say, every week we say, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. This is the invitation. It's the invitation of the Spirit, and it's the invitation of of the bride. Well, let's consider this uh, text, what kind of spirit we've been given. Paul reflects on, character, on Timothy's character with gratitude and joy. He recalls the unfeigned faith that Timothy had. That's in verse 5, a little before our text. This was the same genuine faith that was in his grandmother, Lois, first, and then in his mother, Eunice, also in verse 5. Paul then urges Timothy to get out the poker and stir up the fiery gift that he had been given through the hands of Paul. Verse 6, Paul had laid hands on him, had bestowed a gift of the Spirit on Timothy, and he urges Timothy to stir that gift up. We're going to talk a little bit later about the distinction between gifts of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit, but it's notable here that the Spirit, when he gives himself, is um, giving more than just a, a piecemeal little a little piecemeal thing here and a little piecemeal thing there. He gives himself. That means gifts, wisdom, characteristics, all of it comes with him. So then we come to our text. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound mind. Verse 7. The spirit that has been given to us is a spirit not of fear, it's not a fearful spirit, but rather a powerful spirit, a loving spirit, and the spirit of a sound mind. The application of all this, as Paul sees it, is a refusal 
to be ashamed of the witness or the testimony of the Lord, or ashamed as a corollary of Paul's imprisonment. So when the Spirit is given, when the Spirit, uh, not of love, not of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, when that Spirit is given, what is the end result? The end result is that you're not ashamed of Jesus. You're not ashamed of Jesus. The Spirit doesn't say, hey, look at me. The Spirit says, hey, look at Christ and see him the way he actually is. You're not ashamed of Christ, and you're not ashamed of those who are suffering in Christ-like circumstances, like Paul did in verse 8. So rather, Timothy is urged to be a partaker in gospel afflictions according to the power of God, also verse 8. This gospel is the instrument of our salvation through which God has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I want you to mark that last phrase. What you've been given in Christ, your salvation, was given to you before you existed. The, the, gifts, of the, the gifts that God has poured out upon you were given to you before you existed, before your parents existed, before your ancestors existed, before the world existed. So, that, and that has implications. That has ramifications. You have prehistoric purpose. You have prehistoric purpose. Not only do you have a purpose for your life, that purpose, the purpose of your life, is much older than you are. Your purpose, your design, what God intends for you is much older than you are. It was assigned to you, your salvation, your holy calling was assigned to you, it says in this text, before the world began. Do you see that in verse 9? Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. What do you have? You have nothing that was not given to you before the world, before all worlds. So, it's your, your purpose, your intention, your, the intentionality that attends your life, uh, not, they're not downstream. That purpose is not downstream from your birthday. You don't have to unfold or unpack what that purpose is. Your first birthday is millennia downstream from your assigned purpose. Your life has meaning. Your life, and this is crucial, your life has meaning that is outside the history of the world. Your life in the world has meaning that's outside the history of the world. Your meaning, your essential point, is anchored elsewhere, secure in the eternal counsels of the living God. You mean something. There are no little people. There's no random stray. Uh, that's not what God's up to. God has a place for every brick in his living temple. You are living stones, Peter says, and God has a place. The architect has a place for every last one of those stones. And the blueprints were drawn up before the world was made. Your position was assigned before the world was made. You were called to something before the world was made. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God determined beforehand for us to do. Your good works are all part of the package, the things that you're called to do, the, the people you are called to be a father to, the people you're called to be a mother to, the, the students that you instruct, the, the plans that you draw up, the code that you write, the houses that you build. All of those things are in, in God's purpose and intention, and he wanted to create the world so that you could do those things. So the world, it, the world is... <laughs> Your purpose is the design. Your purpose is the design. The world is simply the delivery platform so that that design can be realized. You don't, you don't get your meaning assigned to you by your family. You don't get your meaning assigned to you by your tribe. You don't get your meaning assigned to you by your government. You don't get your meaning assigned to you by your denomination. Your meaning was assigned to you in accordance with the good purpose and counsels of God before all worlds. Now, this, that's the sort of thing that's going to put iron in your blood. That's the sort of thing that's going to make you think, oh, uh, Napoleon once said that he would, he would rather face, you don't generally quote Napoleon, a 
positively, but... <laughs> but Napoleon once said that he would rather face 10,000 men, well-generaled and well-vittled, than one Calvinist who thought he was doing the will of God. <laughs> so, there's, there's something in that for us. So, God, uh, so, what is the alternative to fear and shame? It says that we've not been given a spirit of fear. The Holy Spirit is, all through Scripture, the Holy Spirit is one who gives boldness, brings boldness. They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke boldly. The Holy Spirit doesn't bring timidity with him. The Holy Spirit does not bring fear or cowardice with him. Paul reminds Timothy that he was not given a spirit of fear, verse 7, not given a spirit of fear. And then after he itemizes the things that the Holy Spirit does bring, he goes on to say that Timothy must not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, verse 8. And he must not be ashamed of the fact that Paul was in prison, and I note again, Paul was in prison again. Can you imagine putting together the Apostle Paul's resume and trying to get him a job at a modern church? <laughs> how, many times have you, how many times have you been flogged by religious authorities? Multiple times. How many, how many times have you been imprisoned and jailed? How many riots have you started? How many, uh, some of you have heard me say this before, there was once an Anglican clergyman who said everywhere the Apostle Paul went, there was either a revival or a riot. He said, everywhere I go, they serve tea. <laughs> we have mistaken what the, we have mistaken the disruptive role that the church is supposed to play. All right, so the, uh, the Apostle Paul was in prison again. Now, there are, are respectable types today, and, there are, and, and those respectable types don't want to have anything to do with those things that Paul would put on his resume and which he included in his letters, all his arrests and, and all the problems that he got in, gotten into. Uh, there were people like that back then. When Paul got arrested, there were Christians who would back away. There were Christians who would say, oh, you know, he says good things. He's a good teacher. He has lots of valuable things to say, but, but. The Holy Spirit bestows three things in this passage. They are power, love, and a sound mind. The Holy Spirit was displayed in power at the first Pentecost when he equipped the disciples to speak in languages they had not studied. That was a gift. The gift of tongues, the, the gift of languages you've not studied is a gift. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit brings. Jesus had told them to wait. Jesus had told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit came with power. He told them that in Luke 24, 49. And that, and that was what was displayed in Jerusalem that day. The Holy Spirit was poured out with power. The gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are indeed powerful, and they are indeed from the Spirit. But that is not the great power he has. That's not the, that's not the, uh, that's not the capstone. The great power of the Holy Spirit is the power of the holy calling, which we have here in our text. Verse 9, who hath saved us and called us, that effectual call is the call of the Holy Spirit. That effectual call is what the Holy Spirit does when he calls you out of your life of unbelief. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. That is the capstone. The, whole, the, gifts of the, the gifts of the Spirit are indeed powerful, but that's not the great power. His great power is the power of the holy calling. He can make tawdry, dirty, little sinners like us into holy saints. He can take grimy little people and turn them into holy saints. C.S. Lewis once commented that, that if, uh, if we were given a glimpse of what people are, would be like after the resurrection. Either, uh, if we were given a glimpse of damnation, it's either the stuff that nightmares are made of, on the one hand, or if you saw the, the most insignificant Christian in his state of glory, your temptation would be to fall down and worship. And, he, and that person would have to say, say something like, stand up, I'm, I'm just a fellow servant together with you. I'm simply a creature. So when the hymn says, when we've been there, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. When we've been there 10,000 years, too bright to look at, where did, that be, where did that person come from? 
Where did that holy saint come from? Where did this glorified saint who looks like Jesus, you look at them, he's not Jesus, but you look at them and you see Jesus. Where did that person come from? That person came from the grimy sewage lagoon that we call our culture, our civilization, our people. The Holy Spirit can take us out of that place and make us holy. Now, remember that the Corinthian church was not lacking in any of the spiritual gifts. Remember that, the, and I'm not trying to disparage the spiritual gifts. What I'm trying to do is rank them. Uh, the, the Bible tells us to order things appropriately. And so we don't despise or look down on the spiritual gifts that the Spirit gives. We just simply have to rank them. In, in 1 Corinthians 1.7, it says that the Corinthian church was not lacking in any gift. The Corinthian church was not lacking in any gift. They had all the gifts. And then later on in the book, Paul had to devote several chapters of traffic control with regard to those gifts. That was 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. He had to say, now when, you're, when someone's prophesying, do this. And when someone's speaking in tongues, then make sure you do. And when someone does this, make sure you do. So he's, he's the traffic cop trying to keep the saints from colliding with one another over the exercise of their gifts. Their gifts were great. Their gifts were good. And Paul, and they were a headache for the Apostle Paul. And you, you're not lacking in any gift, and let me devote three chapters to my discussion of those gifts later on. But even though, and this is important, even though the Corinthian church had all those gifts, they had them in abundance. They had the gifts in abundance. They had so many gifts that they needed a traffic cop. They had all, and Paul says in the first chapter that they had all those gifts. Even though they had all those gifts, what does Paul say in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians? He says, I could not regard them as spiritual men. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You could have every last gift that the Holy Spirit has to give and still be a baby in Christ. And you, you could have every last, last gift that the Holy Spirit has to give and still be, as Paul describes it, carnal. You could, be, you could be fomenting some kind of church split, and fomenting some sort of ungodly church split doesn't take that gift away. There are many people who use their gifts in order to foment church divisions and splits and that sort of thing. They, they, they're very gifted. They, 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 people follow them, and they have, a, they have organizational abilities, and they have the gift of administration, and the gift of teaching, and the gift of this, and the gift of that. The only problem is they're not godly. The problem is that they're not holy. All right, so, and that's what Paul says. That's the problem that they had at Corinth. They had all the gifts, and they had people getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They had all the gifts, and they had a guy living with his stepmother. They had all the gifts, and they had people following factions. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. They, they, they had uh, all the beginning of certain uh, denominations in a kit there in one church. I'm, I'm the Pauline church. I'm the, I'm the Apollonian church. I'm the Petrine church. They had all of that. And, and so Paul says, I, because of that, I had to address you as carnal. So you had gifts, but not the holiness. There were, you had something from the Spirit, but you didn't have the central thing, the most important thing from the Spirit that you're supposed to have, the holy calling that we have in our text. Now, when someone like Paul is thrown into prison for the sake of the gospel, do you think the devil is going to be stupid enough to grant that this was why? Is the, is the devil going to say, yes, we threw him in prison because he was such a saint? Yes, we know he's a good man and that he's bringing us good news of salvation through Christ, which a gracious God is offering us, but we hate our gracious God, and so we're throwing this man into jail anyway. Do you think the devil is that foolish? Do you think the devil is hostile enough to throw you into prison, but stupid enough to give the true reason? No, he, he's not clever enough to frame you, uh, uh, you know, accuse you, and not frame you of some false charge. Remember that Jesus was executed for blasphemy. Jesus was executed for blasphemy, the worst crime in the Decalogue. It was a first table offense. Jesus, uh, the charges against Paul 
made him out to be a pest and a troublemaker. The early Christians were accused of cannibalism. Why? Because of the Lord's Supper. Right? The, uh, you're eating the body and drinking the blood. So the early Christians were accused of cannibalism. They were accused of incest because of the love between brothers and sisters. They called one another brother and sister, and they loved one another. That's obviously incest. Canadian pastors get arrested because they won't bow down in the spirit of fear that has gripped the world. But the official name for that is denying the science. They say to us, we believe the science. Our reply to them needs to be, no, you believe the television. You believe what you're being told. You're being, you believe what you're being fed. And so when someone stands up to overreach, when someone stands up to overreach, then they say, I'm going to preach the gospel, and I'm going to meet with God's people like he told us to do. I'm going to do that. And they say, well, you're a science denier, or you're an enemy of the public, you're, and we're going to arrest you. This is a conflict of vision. The devil's not so stupid as to say we're, we're actually throwing you in prison because uh, you are standing up to tyranny. That's not, that's, not, that's not what's going to happen. And as I've reminded you before, we all know, you, you should know that if uh, during the course of a service, uh, there was a stir at the door, and then one of the deacons came up to me and, during the sermon and said, the fire chief's out, outside, and he tells us the roof's on fire. We would, not have to have a, we would not have to convene a session meeting of the elders to determine whether to evacuate. Right? And we would not have to quiz the fire chief to find out if he was born again. Uh, we believe in overlapping jurisdictions. We believe that there are times when the civil authority can tell us there's a, tor there's a tornado coming or the dam broke or, you know, something. We, we do believe that there are genuine emergencies that we should be good citizens and be fully cooperative, which is why we did what we did when we first, when this thing first hit. Uh, um, we've, what, celebrated uh, the first anniversary of 15 days to flatten the curve. We've, so... A year ago, we, we met online for three weeks, and then we did a drive-in service for three weeks. And then when, when it became apparent what was actually going on, the roof was not on fire, the dam had not broken, it was not, things were not as they were being described, we said, well, we have our orders from God. We're supposed to meet together. We're supposed to gather together. We're supposed to worship God. And so we began doing that. And when we do this, we're doing this as dutiful citizens and as obedient Christians. But when there's a collision, when there's a collision, the uh, people are going to say, what, what are the charges? The, the charges are not going to be they were representing God's gospel to a sinful and fallen world. That's, that's not what the charges are going to be. And that's not what the charges were against Paul. He's a pest and a troublemaker, and he's, he's disrupting people. And there's, that's what happens. And so Paul says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, when the Holy Spirit is on you, it will equip you to not be ashamed of Jesus. Not be ashamed of Jesus, who was executed for being a blasphemer. It's going to equip you to not be ashamed of Paul, who's in prison again. So you put all these things together. The Spirit, the Spirit is the one who has uh, equipped you to have a sound mind. That's the third thing. The, the Holy Spirit is given uh, to you to empower you, the Holy Spirit is given to you to enable you to love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And then he has given you a sound mind. Now, one of the central aspects of having a sound mind in this world is the result, has the result of giving you a purpose and a meaning that is grounded outside the world. You are secured. The reason you don't need to be timid the reason you don't need to be cowardly, the reason you don't need to be frightened, the reason he's not giving you a spirit of fear is because God knows what he's doing. God has everything under complete and exhaustive control. And so your purpose, your intention, your design, your job description, the, the good works that, you, that lie before you, the good works that you are supposed to walk into tomorrow, the good works assigned for you tomorrow, are the works that the Holy Spirit has prepared for you. And because the Holy Spirit is sovereign, and this was all assigned to you before the world began, you don't need to get, all, you don't need to get tangled up in lofty philosophical questions. Don't start, at the, don't start at the philosophical end. Start at the practical end. Don't start with the gifts. Start with the fruit. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If someone has the fruit of the Spirit, by definition, they are godly. By definition, they're not carnal. If someone is loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, if they're that way, Paul could not say, yes, you have all the fruit of the Spirit, but I had to address you as carnal. He doesn't know. That's not the way it is. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, then you are walking with God. If you have the gifts of the Spirit, you may or may not be walking with God. If you have the gifts of the Spirit and you are walking with God, those gifts can be mightily used. And God wants to use them. That's why he gave the gifts. That's why why Jesus ascends on high and he gave gifts to men. So those gifts are given for a purpose, and the purposes are to be holy, but they're not automatically holy. Love, defined by Scripture, is by definition holy. Joy, defined by Scripture, is by definition godly. Um, Peace, defined by Scripture, is by definition godly. So, start with the fruit and move on to the gifts. Don't start with the gifts and hope that the fruit tags along. All right? We are called to a holy calling. Now, I said don't start with the philosophy, start with the, practi- the practical end of it. Don't, when you talk about the sovereignty of God, when you think about the sovereignty of God, don't get tangled up in questions about whether you were predestined to reach for the pencil with your left hand or your right. Okay, here I'm sitting at the desk. Before all worlds, did God predestine that I would do this or do that? Well, it's easy to answer. Which one did you do? Whichever one you did, that's the one that was predestined. And you can't say, I'm going to fake him out. (laughs) Whatever you do, whatever you do, that's what is foreordained. But don't start with those big philosophy questions. Don't get tangled up in that. You were predestined to be holy. You are predestined to be holy. That's Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 1.4, you are predestined to holiness. That is your purpose. Ephesians 2.10, God's workmanship, which you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, good works, not gifted works, but holy works, to do good works, good works that are characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. So that's your purpose. You are predestined You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's Romans 8.23. And the Holy Spirit is the one doing the sculpting. The Holy Spirit is the one who is in you and with you, sculpting you into the image of Christ. So the Spirit of Christ is dwelling in you, and he's the one who's taking off those rough edges. He is the one who's convicting you of sin. He is the one who's encouraging you when you need to be encouraged. The Spirit, that, that's your destination. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And as one who's predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, the Spirit is with you and in you to bring you there. The Holy Spirit is with you and in you to bring you there. In Ephesians, again, it says, we by one Spirit have, have been, we both, Jew and Gentile together, by one Spirit through Jesus come to the Father. So what does that mean? Well, to to use a homely illustration, the Father is the destination point we're going to. The Father is the city we're driving to. The Son is the road. The Son is the highway. Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the road. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one who brings us to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the car. So the Father is the destination. Jesus is is the road, and the Holy Spirit is the one who motivates and empowers you to to travel on that road to come to the Father. That's what's happening. Your salvation in front of you, beneath you, and behind you is Trinitarian. The Father, we, we, Jesus, um, when he's asked by the disciples, teaches to pray. When you pray, pray to our Father. All right? no, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says, I'm the road, I'm the road, no man comes to the Father except through me. So the destination is the Father. The way to that destination is the sun. The power that equips us to want to travel that road and to equips us to want to come to that destination, to want to come to the Father, is the Holy Spirit. All of it, and all of it is working in harmony together. The Father, Son, and Spirit are all working toward the same end. They are doing different things, but they're, they're all in working in concert together to get us to the same place, which is the worship of the Father. And so... That's your destination, the Father. The Son is the way. We glo- How do we get there? How do we get to the Father? By glorifying Jesus. 
And how do we glorify Jesus? By listening to the Spirit. Now that's, that's what's happening. And it truly glorifies the Father and it truly glorifies Jesus when we listen to the Spirit's urging to walk in accordance with the holy calling first. That's the first order of business. So the Spirit is the one who brings you there. He brings you there with no fear and no shame. No fear and no shame. A holy calling, a sincere faith, power, love, and a sound mind. All of it is integrated together, knit together in love. Colossians 2.2, as the Spirit completes His work. As the Spirit completes the work that He was sent into the world to do. So the Holy Spirit, the reason, um, let's be frank, you and I, if the Holy Spirit had not saved us out of our sins, pretty much everybody here wouldn't have anything in common with anybody else here. We are, we are a disparate group of people. We are a ragtag, motley crew of people. And some people, well, I, there might be three or four people that share my interest in chess or ham radio or quilting or, you know, whatever. But th those are special interest things. We, are, we would not belong together as a group unless the Holy Spirit had been poured out on his people and undertaken the task of knitting us together in Christ. That's what makes us the bride. So the bridegroom and the, the Spirit... The Spirit is the one knitting these disparate people together into the bride. And then the bride and the bridegroom together say to a hurting world, come. So the Holy Spirit was sent into the world. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon the world in order to do this work. So the question would be, why not here? Why not here? Why not now? Why not in you? Now you say, well, I'm not sure. Uh, well, what, what is that that makes us resist? What is the, what's the thing that in us that causes the caution lights on the dashboard to start blinking? Well, it's because, all the, you know, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, that stuff, that's going to really mess with how you live in your household. That's going to disrupt things. That's going to, that's going to disrupt how you interact with your kids. That's going to disrupt how you talk to your neighbor. That's going to disrupt how you interact with others at work. If, if, if the Holy Spirit just gives you a gift, a gift of teaching, you can explain things better than you used to be able to. If the Holy Spirit gives you a gift, and you can still go through life. And if the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to give you this particular gift, you might have additional responsibilities assigned to you. You might, and, and almost always, additional privileges come with those responsibilities. But you know what happens when the Holy Spirit works in you, his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? You know what those, the, those uh, fruits are? Those fruits are an invitation to die. That's what all of them are, invitation to die. Love, what is that? Invitation to die. Joy, what is that? An invitation to die. Peace, what is that? An invitation to die. Die to your anxiety. Die to your hostility. Die to your tumult, inner tumult. When the Holy Spirit is at work in us, he's mortifying sin, and he's causing godly fruit to grow, and there is no way to do that apart from a pattern of death, burial, and resurrection. That's what's happening in the cultivation of the fruit of the Spirit. When the fruit of the Spirit is being uh, tilled in you when when the when the Lord is wanting fruit to grow on your tree, He prunes, and the, and the pruning hurts. The pruning makes you you know I don't want Him to prune. Last time He pruned me, I looked like pretty stumpy until the spring. <laughs> Have you ever seen a sad tree after somebody has pruned it really good? You don't want to look like that. You don't want to feel like that. You don't. But you would boy, it'd be nice to have that fruit the following fall. Well, there's one way, there's one way. The Holy Spirit does these things. So the Holy Spirit completes his work. So why not here? Why not with you? Why not now? You say, but I'm only, you say, but I'm, I'm a teenager. Uh, uh, Pastor Wilson, you've made a mistake. I'm just a teenager. Holy Spirit does this with teenagers. I'm just a boy, I'm just a girl. Holy Spirit does this with boys and girls. Or I'm not a teenager, I'm too old. You're getting a pattern here. I'm, I'm too young for the Holy Spirit to have his way with me. I'm too, 
I'm in the prime of life. That's not a convenient time. I've got things to do. I'm too old. I, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Now, you know what? That, that's not a young person talking. That's not an old person talking. That's a sinner talking. That's someone who doesn't want to let go of certain things. So what do you do? Well, realize, submit to the fact that you've been saved, you've been given a certain kind of spirit, and this spirit has called you with a holy calling. He's not, and not according to your, your works, that's also in verse 9, not according to your works, but he, you've been called to good works. Again, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you're not saved by your own works, you're saved by grace through faith, you're not saved by good works, but you are saved to good works. So if you're saved by the Holy Spirit, you are saved from evil works to good works, not by good works. And that calling, that holy calling that's going to get you to the point where you are loving your family, loving your neighbor, loving your co-workers, interacting in the joy and peace and love of the Holy Spirit, that sound mind that the text talks about, when you are seeing the world with a sound mind, that is going to be the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And that work of the Holy Spirit in you is he's summoning you now. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. This is the word proclaimed. This message is for you. This gospel is for you. The Spirit was poured out upon you. And the good works that you are called to do, the good works that God wants you to walk into, those good works were assigned to you millennia ago. They're, they're waiting for you. It's like walking into a banquet and walking around the table looking for your name card, looking for your place card. Your name is there. Are you a Christian? Are you baptized? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you, are you here worshiping him, honestly, sincerely? Then that means there's a place card for you, and you go and find your seat. And that seat, the place where you're supposed to sit, those are the good works that God's prepared in advance for you to do. The Spirit set the table. The Spirit leads you to the table. The Spirit leads you to that table, and that table is Christ. And then we find ourselves in communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've given to us through your word. We thank you for all of these things because we are praying to you in the, in the name of Jesus. We are praying to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, as we pray, we would lift up to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, when we partake of the bread and wine together, as we are just about to do, we are doing much more than partaking of just the bread and wine, even though physical eating and drinking is mysterious enough in its own right. In addition to the bread and wine, there are, uh, there are also other glorious things displayed. There is a true and ultimate fellowship here, and it is a fellowship that operates on a number of different levels. First and foremost, we are partaking of Christ. The Holy Spirit has gathered all of us up and has brought us into the heavenly places where Christ is enthroned, and in that place, he enables us to commune in him and also with him. Second, we together are all the body of Christ, and this means that we are partaking of one another. This is the assigned way for us to say to one another, my life for yours. We partake of the one loaf, and in this way, we demonstrate that we are the one loaf. You cannot partake of Christ without also partaking of his people. To be friends with the bridegroom is to be friends with the bride. And third, even though we partake of a risen Christ, a living Christ, in some mysterious way, we also partake in the proclamation of a dead Christ. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul says, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes. We know that Christ is alive because he is coming, but we also know that he died for sin once for all, and that death is constantly displayed to the world through this meal. So the exhortation is this. In Scripture, we're told in a number of places to walk worthy of the calling you've received. You've received a holy calling. Walk worthy of that calling. In other places, we're told to walk with the Spirit. The Spirit is with you. The Spirit is in you. The Spirit is doing things. We, we should be careful, be paying attention, to get in step with the Spirit, to be in sync with the Spirit. And the first step with that, to, to that is wanting to. Do you want to be in step with the Spirit? Do you pray that way. Lord, I, and if you don't want to, then pray that God would make you to want to. Lord, I'm not willing yet, but I'm willing to be made willing. Make me willing to be in step with your spirit. 
and back up one back up as often as it takes to say, Lord, make me do what I need to do to be in step with your spirit. And he can do it, as the benediction says. Now to him <clears throat> who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.